Good day, and welcome to the Diversified Fixed Income webcast. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to product specialist Sam Nussbaum. Please go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Double Line Diversified Fixed Income webcast hosted by Deputy CIO Jeffrey Sherman. The title of today's webcast is Managing Through the Interest Rate Volatility of 2023. Today's webcast will cover three of DoubleLine's mutual funds, the low duration bond fund, the core fixed income fund, and the flexible income fund, along with one of our active ETFs, the DoubleLine Opportunistic Bond ETF, ticker symbol DBND. Some notable upcoming DoubleLine webcasts include on December 5th, the final total return webcast of 2023 hosted by DoubleLine CEO and CIO Jeffrey Gunlock, along with Portfolio Manager Andrew Sue. And on January 9th, Jeffrey Gunlock will be hosting his annual Market Outlook titled Just Markets. To register for these webcasts and others, please visit our website at DoubleLine.com. Some notable DoubleLine thought leadership uh, include two of our video series, uh, DoubleLine Channel 11, hosted by Portfolio Manager Ken Shinoda, uh, along with PS Perspectives, hosted by the DoubleLine Product Specialist team. Both are available on DoubleLine.com and YouTube. And two of our podcasts, the Monday Morning Minutes podcast, hosted by Portfolio Managers Sam Lau and Jeffrey Sherman, excuse me, Jeffrey Mayberry, and the Sherman Show podcast, hosted by today's webcast host, Deputy CIO Jeffrey Sherman. Some standardized performance listed on the following slides for the funds that will be covered in today's webcast. Despite the interest rate volatility year to date through September 30th of 2023, relative performance across the double line fixed income asset allocation product suite has been strong. And I'll note here, the double line low duration bond fund iShare class has outperformed its benchmark by 220 basis points year to date. The double line flexible income fund I share class has outperformed its benchmark by 189 basis points year to date. The double line core fixed income fund has outperformed its benchmark by 114 basis points year to date. And finally, the double line opportunistic bond ETF DBND has outperformed its benchmark by 106 basis points year to date. So with that, let me turn the webcast over to Deputy CIO Jeffrey Sherman. Uh, all right. Thanks, Sam. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, as we saw from the title, we're talking about managing through the interest rate volatility of 2023. And uh, what a difference uh, nine months later makes as we sit here in early October, uh, where there was ebullience in the market uh, during the first few weeks of January. Uh, we've had a lot of whipsaw behavior. We got the sell off back in rates in February. We had come the banking scare in March. Uh, we had this kind of grind sideways for a little bit in yields, and then we've had this resurgence in yields once again over the last six to eight weeks. And so uh, it's been uh, there's been really no reprieve within the bond market uh, to to date. Uh, but the good news is is it's starting to look like we're getting towards the end of the hiking cycle. It's looking like even with this new repricing out there that there seems to be some value in fixed income. And so. Uh, markets are always humbling. They always remind you that things can last a lot longer than you think, uh, and they tend to go against the consensus, which all of a sudden we're seeing massive capitulation in the bond market where almost every single Wall Street strategist out there uh, is trying to one-up each other about how high rates are going to go um, after missing this uh, for most of the year. So let's talk about where we are in the macroeconomic environment right now. Uh, let's talk about what that means for fixed income markets, what it has done. Let's look at some of the opportunity set going forward and how the portfolios are positioned and a couple of different ideas for trying to execute uh, in this challenging market, which we all hear the mantra from the Fed that they're going to be higher from longer. Uh, so I'm going to focus a little bit on the shorter duration side of the equation to start the discussion on the portfolios because uh, there are some very op interesting opportunity sets there. There's pros and cons for using that versus a traditional bond portfolio. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into the macro. And uh, what I wanted to start off with was the policy rates here uh, that we've seen across the globe. And uh, the, the U.S. Uh, is, is not uh, operating in a vacuum. And you can see this over the last uh, two decades or so that effectively the entire 
developed world tends to really behave in a similar fashion. Now, there is that one aberration. You can't really see it. It's a, it's in a dark brown color there. That's Japan. Uh, that, but essentially, they just keep their rates uh, between, uh, I guess it's uh, between minus uh, 10 basis points and, and, a, and a whopping uh, plus, plus 25 or so. But effectively, what you see here is that this is a coordinated cycle. It's because, again, we, we tend to consume a lot of the same things. Uh, we tend to run coordinated policies because of the currency moves as well. But uh, no one's really been sparred in this environment. Um, yes, some, some rates are higher than others, uh, but ultimately what you've seen is, a, is really a repricing around the globe. And so it's not just the U.S. bond market. It's actually been worse uh, outside of the U.S. because, again, starting with lower yields and in some cases negative yields uh, in those markets. Um, and then, again, uh, if, as a dollar investor, the currency adjustment. But to kind of zoom in on this, too, um, so the last slide showed what has happened. Uh, this is zoomed in really over the last two years, but also throws in the forecast that's implied uh, from various parts, uh, or sorry, from financial markets. And see, so you can see here that even though there wasn't a lot of the punditry, say, meaningfully higher rates in 2023 from where we started the year, um, what you have seen is that expectations are that we're really nearing the end of this cycle. So uh, the one area that uh, has a little bit of a hike still priced in uh, is the Bank of England. Um, you know, you're looking at the Fed today, too. Uh, if you think about this, actually, uh, I want to say it's about um, two months ago that the BOE was actually projected to go above the Fed funds rate. And you can see here there's kind of some optionality in the pricing out there. Uh, again, this looks at the futures market to, to determine what's going on. But you can see that the market is pretty much saying that we're nearing the end of this hiking regime. And that goes really across the board uh, for all the developed central banks. Uh, moving on to the economic data. So uh, one thing that's been the aberration is the surprise uh, that we've seen across the market. So if you rewind the clock to begin the year, uh, the, this, the consensus was there's going to be this Chinese reopening story uh, that the data, you know, the, the Chinese were going to follow a similar path that the developed world did when coming out of lockdown, massive travel, big consumption, big boom to the economy, and that was built into the expectations. Uh, the other idea that was baked into expectation at the end of the year, U.S. was going to kind of muddle along, potentially a, uh, a recession uh, towards the beginning or late first half of the year, potentially early second half of the year. And both of those things couldn't be farther from the truth. In fact, I'll talk about the U.S. Uh, as we go through this a little bit more, but uh, how strong the U.S. has been uh, backward looking. If you're able to hear some of my comments from my Bloomberg interview last week, it's one thing we were talking about is that, yes, that, that is what has happened, but it's very dangerous to extrapolate the current experience and assume that goes on indefinitely. Same thing with China, you can see here, Chinese market is disappointed. Uh, we've all read about the high headlines and the challenges that they have within there, but also the Eurozone is disappointed as well. So this uh, US exceptionalism uh, is a phrase that was thrown around uh, during, you know, post GFC pre pandemic. And you're starting to see a little bit of that right now. Um, but again, this is uh, just relative to expectations. And so this is why we've seen some of that stronger economic activity this year. Um, looking at the manufacturing side, so this is a heat map uh, looking at the production and manufacturing indices. And again, it's a wall of numbers here. So we color code this. Uh, apologies to those that can't see the difference between red and green. But what you see here is that there's been a serious deterioration in the manufacturing sectors globally. Very few places are actually um, having an expansionary environment according to these surveys. Um, and the bulk of the developed world is extremely red. Look at Germany there is one of the worst readings we've seen there. Um, and some of that, the data that we're seeing out of Germany rivals what they were showing early in the pandemic as well. So manufacturing is definitely deteriorated. The U.S. did have a nice uptick. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, again, there, there seems to be this kind of global manufacturing slowdown. And that's Remember, we had the, the supply chain issues. We had to have a significant resurgence coming out of the pandemic. And so as one of our macro analysts or, or uh, team members likes to say, well, a lot of this data has to normalize back to the downside to net all of this out. And looking at uh, GDP, uh, I, I'm still using this back to 2010 because uh, what I like to show is how tight the range is for GDP. It vacillates between like a 1.8 and, you know, in, in a good year, you get like a, you know, a 2.9% growth rate. Uh, but in general, that, that the center of gravity was about 2.3%. Um, we seem to be drifting back towards those regions. Now, 
We obviously had the dip down in 2020. We all know what happened there, a significant rebound after massive stimulus and trying to get the economy back together. But notice here, even looking at what we had in 2022 and now the estimates for 2023, again, it's still early uh, for those get finalized and converged to actual GDP, we have about 2.1%. So this is back to the trend line where you were before. Although remember, expectations were that the U.S. would probably slip into a recession this sometime this year. You can kind of see some of this as well as 2024's estimates are grinding down. Look at that green line and how it's been revised downward. Some of that is just the pull forward of what we've seen in 2023. Notice that that purple line was dipping down. You know that got pulled forward, and so now the expectation are we're gonna we're gonna ultimately have to have a slower growth rate in 2024. So. There is a setup for some of this out there. Um, there are some headwinds. Some of those I was identifying in that Bloomberg interview. Apologies that I uh, couldn't, couldn't hear it very clearly because of some of the, the music over it. But in general, what we're looking at here is the setup we see. And I'll go through some of these charts on why some of this is starting to look like we're getting later parts of the cycle. Again, later does not mean recession. Slowdown or, or, or decelerating growth does not mean recession. But some of that exceptionalism that we've seen uh, is indeed potentially behind us. Um, here's another way of looking at this. This is uh, post-World War II, uh, U.S. real GDP. So it shows the uh, GDP growth rate. Because it's such a long time series on a logarithmic scale, that's why the scale looks weird like that. But what it allows you to do is compare growth rates. And notice our trend line back, back to the financial crisis. So we were on this kind of upward sloping trajectory. Something happened during the GFC where it, it hit our potential growth rate. Some of that was probably because we let bad businesses go on. Again, we were mired in this significant, uh, what was looking like a global depression. Um, so we cut rates to zero. It slowed down the growth rate, right? Look at the slope of that line. Something changed at the GFC. And with all the talk about this U.S. exceptionalism and everything that's going on, notice what we've done. We are back on the pre or post-GFC pre-pandemic trend. Nothing has really changed. Yes, there's been a dip down. There was a recovery since then, but we seem to be back on this trajectory here. And again, some of this is CBO estimates. Um, so the, I'm sorry, this is the IMF estimate. Sorry about that. Uh, when thinking about overall growth rates. And so uh, for all this shock and awe that happened, supply shocks, the uh, you know trying to get back to some normalcy in the marketplace, essentially all we've done is be able to plug the gap. And I'll show how we've done that uh, as I get later in the slides. But we talk about interest rates. We talk about how it's supposed to put pressure on the overall markets. But notice here, uh, looking at something called the financial condition indices. And so Bloomberg puts one out. There's a few investment banks put these out as well. But just try and talk about, well, is policy being accommodative or is it tighter? And they use a bunch of components. What's nice about Bloomberg, we can look through all the data. Uh, you can see the components uh, up top of what, what's driving this. But notice here that essentially this says that right now, if you look at what's going on in financial markets, remember, a lot of these are financial capital markets driven ideas. But it's the cost of financing the marketplace, looking at spread levels. And essentially what you find is that they're pretty accommodative in the marketplace. So as stringent and tight as the Fed has tried to be or that the Fed has been to date, it's being offset by some of these other areas. And some of that is due to, as I mentioned, uh, we've had we've had a strong consumer over the first uh, you know nine months of the year. Uh, we've seen inflation be disinflationary and coming down. So a lot of these things have led into more accommodative conditions in the marketplace versus even with the uh, versus what the Fed is trying to achieve by being tighter as well. So uh, you can see in there the the one of the few things is kind of the move index. I'll talk about that uh, before we're done here. But there is, aren't a lot of things that are detracting from uh, this more accommodative environment from there. And so uh, another way of looking at GDP, since we only get it infrequently. I know people are up in arms about the uh, the Atlanta Fed GDP now estimate for the qu third quarter, which is still hovering above 5%. Um, if you look at uh, one of the competing models from the New York Fed, uh, it says kind of in the in the low 2%. I don't know. I, I think the truth's probably somewhere in the middle. But another way of looking at this is something called the Fed Weekly Economic Index. And so this is an amalgamation of a bunch of economic statistics. Uh, they come out uh, to try to help forecast GDP as well. And what you see here is that 
the relationship between the economic index and the GDP, it's not great. Uh, you know, again, it's a little more high frequency, but it tends to get some of the directionality correct uh, when looking at where we're going. And what it's saying right now today is that GDP probably is somewhere in the, in the kind of low 2% range. Hmm, strangely in line with where economic forecasts are, kind of in, that, in line with where that overall long-term trend has been in growth rate since the global financial crisis. And so, uh, again, these are, these are good things that the economy has been growing. But remember, when we look at data like this, this is not a forward-looking indicator. This is a backward-looking indicator. It tells you what has indeed happened, not what is going to happen. And so some of the more kind of uh, contemporaneous to slightly forward-looking indicators are things like manufacturing and well services. Uh, I showed you what the global manufacturing picture looks like. Uh, the ISM puts out data on both manufacturing as well as the services. And we know that services makes up the bulk of the U.S. economy as well. Uh, this includes things like leisure, dining out. Uh, it also includes your home. Uh, as well. And you can see here that the services data has indeed bounced up and is looking somewhat expansionary as well. So what you find with, if you look at this manufacturing, we've been mired in a manufacturing recession for the last year plus here in the U.S. If you go back and look at the other side, you can see the entire developed world has been as well, or at least in a, a, a maybe it's not a manufacturing recession, but it's a manufacturing contraction. However, it's the service side of the equation that's held up. And if you look back at this chart, and at least over the last three recessions, it's not that you just have to have this contraction in manufacturing. You also have to have it simultaneously with the services component. And so, again, we've seen some of the, the CHIPS Act helping the IRA, um, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, is helping put some more investment on the manufacturing side. But this is the resilience that you see uh, in the service sector. And so, remember, uh, this is also measuring the latest measurement is through peak holiday travel as well. So we tend to get these boosts um, in, in the service data when you look at the seasonal component of it as well. And one thing that alarmed me about the March banking issue was that I was really afraid uh, post uh, SBB and, and some of the activity saw and some of the scare we saw in the banking sector that this was gonna really put a contraction on small business credit. And so one way of thinking about this, NFIB puts out a survey, the optimism came out today. It's a little bit under expectations, but um, I, I don't really glean much from today's report as well. But what you find in this, too, is that if you look at that orange line, this is how many respondents are saying that they have tighter lending standards for loans. So tighter is not easier to get a loan. They're making it more difficult uh, to get loans. So you can see there that this level, this orange line, seems to be consistent with the last four recessions. Now, again, four is not a huge sample size, uh, but usually when you get a meaningful contraction on how many entities are actually contracting, it gets to a pretty, um, you know, once you get about half of them reporting that, um, it's usually signs that potentially there's a recession at some point in the near term. Now, the other thing is that blue line, the blue line, what it's trying to do now is telling you, okay, the availability of a loan. So when that number is going down, fewer loans are available as well. So tightening conditions just talk about harder uh, to acquire the loan. Also, from the standpoint of uh, actually uh, interest service, documentation, um, you know, higher rates, those are things about tightening standards. But that availability alone is, where are you willing to make them? And what we've seen recently is there's been an uptick in the ability to make them as well. And so, or there's fewer uh, on the downtick, as I should say, as that series tends to be pretty much negative in, in most scenarios. But uh, we was getting scary there for the last few months. Uh, we kind of got out of an area that doesn't look as consistent with the negative side. Uh, but seeing that orange line continue to deteriorate does cause us some concern. Why do I point this out? We talk about small business, medium enterprise being the backbone of the economy. Uh, we also talk about the job creation. Most of this job creation in the last 18 to 24 months occurred at this level of, of enterprise. And so what you see here is that if this is such a dependent part of our overall economy and these people are having harder access to capital, it is problematic. So what I showed you in those financial conditions and talking about the easing of conditions because corporate spreads or some level, high yield spreads, muni spreads, that's great if you have access to capital markets. But if you're a small business and you need access to money, you borrow at something called the prime rate. Well, for those of you not familiar, prime is 300 basis points over SOFR. 
So typically that is the best rate there is out there and banks offer a spread above that if you wanna acquire a loan. Well, today's rate, a prime rate is eight and a half percent after this Fed policy. So if you have a revolver or you're looking to, to generate or, or, or create a new loan out there, originate a new loan, these are the market rates that you're paying today. This has to have some impact of the slowdown. So I know the Fed was championing the concept that you know uh, the long and variable lags are going to be shorter this time because we have forward guidance and look how great we've done so far. This is about usually when you start to see cracks from the hiking regime. And this is one part of the market. I emphasize this in the webcaster in the year on this. It's been something I'm watching. The good news is it doesn't look as scary as it was when it comes to availability of loans. But if you think about the rate move we've seen if uh, in the last eight weeks or so prior to uh, this, this unfortunate new uh, invasion slash war, is you find that having these asset prices go down again, it just renews the nervousness about the banks. And I didn't include the you know kind of small bank index, the KBW index out there. Uh, that shows the index performance of the banks, but we are actually today below the levels we saw back in March this year. Yes, we went a little bit lower after that, uh, but we're not back plumbing the highs where we saw this big resurgence uh, post uh, no banks going down for a couple of months. So I think there's going to be some renewed kind of uh, scrutiny on the banks. We'll hear more about this when we get third quarter earnings as well. But I, I could see some uh, some new eyes coming back to these hold to maturity portfolios. So. Again, I'm not going to harp on that. Uh, what I want to do is talk about the inflationary regime because I think we we have set up and a lot of the pain points we saw in the inflationary environment are indeed behind us. Um, so let's look at that right now. If you follow our work at Double Line, you know we like import export prices uh, to think about what's going on from the inflationary uh, argument. Uh, as, as Mr. Gunlock says, these don't have the hedonic adjustments. You're just looking at here's the price coming in, price going out. Um, and again, it's nominal dollars. And so this allows you to see that there has been some pressure. That uptick you see there, some of that is driven by the recent resurgence in oil prices uh, back in back in August. So um, again, looking at this data, it does not augur for this uh, really strong inflationary environment. Another thing I like to look at is prices pay, the manufacturing sector. Uh, we were talking about this in strategy meeting today, uh, where one of our PMs was saying, well, uh, if you want to go find appliances right now, remember that was uh, all the all the uh, craze 18 months ago. You couldn't find something. You were on massive delay. Now they're 40, 50, 60 percent off. And part of that is inventory restocking. Got to move that inventory out. But notice the price is paid. There are more people that are paying lower prices today than we're paying higher prices today. So this is an input. This leads into the PPI, which sends a lead CPI. Uh, so again, this is a positive attribute. Uh, again, it doesn't mean that we're going to see deflation in, in goods uh, at this stage. But if you look at the good side, uh, which I'll show you in a little bit, you'll see there has been some disinflationary to deflationary pressure. Uh, let's talk about the CPI. And so uh, let's not just look at the U.S. I, I bring this out every every you know six to 12 months to remind everyone that inflation, I know Milton Friedman said it's, it's, it's always a mon monetary uh, phenomenon, but I like to say that it is a global phenomenon as well. And the only thing that doesn't really look like it's participating, uh, like the other lines here, is that purple line. And the purple line got disconnected uh, back in 19 as well as in 20, and has really been uh, the one that's um, uh, kind of the aberration to the rest of the world, and that's China. You can see world uh, CPI, you can see developed market CPI, you can see EMX China CPI, all are running at elevated levels. And that hookup, uh, some of it is because, again, as, as I said, that spike in energy price that we saw um, in the last, let's call it two months or so. So in general, there this, this idea that the U.S. drove inflation or it's coming from other parts of the world, this is really the fiscal response globally of monetary policy being extremely accommodative, the fiscal response mechanism uh, of, of throwing money at the problems as well. And we all did it, plus we all got hit by the supply chain constraints when we lost one of the biggest producers in the world. So let's come back here to the US. Let's look at uh, core inflation here. Um, so uh, I mentioned that we have goods. Goods is the gray area. Uh, you can't see its contribution. So when I talk about contribution to CPI, this is the each of these three pieces 
it takes whatever their CPI rate is times their weight in the core CPI to give you that shaded area. And you can see here that from post GFC, we have infrequently had bouts of goods inflation. However, we primarily had goods deflation. Notice that gray area from late 2012 to roughly, you know, early in the pandemic in, in 20, or, or really once we're getting kind of the other side of the pandemic, um, was deflationary. It was subtracting from inflation. We see the surgeons there. This is probably why the Fed wanted to say things were transitory. We saw it on the good side, but notice that that gray area has effectively disappeared now. It's essentially got a zero contribution to overall CPI. It's the yellow area and the blue area. And I'll focus on the blue area first. Um, kudos to Jay Powell for coming up with this new idea of super core inflation, which is core services X shelter. I'll get to that. I have another slide on that. But I've used this slide for many years because I like to show people how stable that, that yellow area is. The housing market has some volatility. Notice how much contribution housing is giving to us today in the shelter component. But notice back in the, in the global financial crisis, how much when real estate went down 40, 50, 60%, I think nationwide it went down around 35%. Notice that it only detracted about half a percentage from, from CPI in the 2010 experience. And so this is where we talk about shelter runs on a lag. This should roll over a little bit. Yes, we have rent resetting. Um, it probably doesn't decelerate as much as fast as it accelerated, but in general, uh, you're going to get some pressure downward on this. Look at the trend in inflation. The one thing that is not trending downward is that yellow area. Notice one over the last uh, 32 years, the yellow area has always been a positive contributor, whereas the other two parts of the series have not. So focusing on just that area, which Jay Powell calls super core, maybe isn't the best area to focus on uh, for having it. Maybe it is that they want that stability in the rate and they want some level of inflation. Notice that we got some disinflationary pressure during the pandemic. It kind of came back, but it's been relatively stable. So this next slide breaks out super core and shows you here's super core, whether you use the weights in CPI or whether you use the weights in PCE. And effectively, it gives you a, a level of inflation that is beyond comfort. This is beyond the Fed's comfort zone, right? They're used to this measure being in the that's called the one and a half to two and a half percent range. They can live with that, especially in PCE. Uh, most of the time it, it hovers around uh, closer to two percent. But notice this tick up. And to me, by focusing on this component and uh, this component, it's it's one way to say inflation's too high. It sounds great to call it this super core idea. It sounds like it's super important, right? We throw the word super in front of it. And look, it, it it gives me the ability to say it's above our level and I can hike as much as I need to. Now, Grant, the Fed doesn't need a reason to hike. They can do what they want to do. Um, but in general, this is a measure that's out there. Now, what is super core measure? Well, it only gets rid of three key things, energy, food, and housing, or as I call it, the inverted Maslow's hierarchy. Only those three things we need to live right, or at least live a, a decent life is to have those three things. If you strip those out, that's what super core is. And so it's things like leisure, it's things like services on the, the food sector, it, um, it, when, when dining out, because that's different from food stuff. So it is this area, it also includes Medicare, medical bills, um, educational side. So these tend to be pretty stable and kind of stickier things. So the idea that the Fed is focused on this, it causes me a little bit of pause, but this also tells me that maybe and maybe what you'll find is that the Fed stays too high for too long because they're looking at the wrong measure. Again, I'm not here to rationalize Fed policy. I don't see Fed cuts anytime uh, in the near term coming. Uh, they probably come some point in 2024, um, but we're going to have to see a degradation of the data set to get there. I'm bringing this up because I get so many questions on super core uh, any day, but to me, it's it's a pretty worthless measure. Um, moving along, the unemployment rate, this is what the, the key to watch. Um, whenever an unemployment goes above its 12-month moving average, you should get on watch. Uh, whenever it crosses its 36-month moving average, we've always had a recession, which makes sense, right? When the unemployment rate goes up, people are losing jobs. You lose jobs, less money to go around in the system, and it causes some problems. This is not concerning at this level uh, today. Looking at it, yes, we've crossed the average. We should be on watch, continue to watch this. But effectively, 
Uh, it really hasn't done a lot for the overall economy. And some of that is because we have job openings. Um, there's jobs out there. Uh, they may not be the exact job you want. Uh, you compare it to labor force. Look at that bottom line. We take the ratio of the jobs available to the JOLT survey, or the JOLT survey, I guess I should call it, uh, and you compare that to the people that are looking for work. And you can see that that ratio hit two jobs available for every person looking for work uh, back kind of in peak early 2022. We're down to about one and a half now. So although there was this improvement in job openings uh, last week, we also saw the improvement in, in some of the um, or the, the amount of people looking for more work. That's That's been a higher participation rate out there. So you have this imbalance. That's another reason the Fed has been focused on uh, keeping these higher for longer. But the good news is, at least to employers, is that the wage growth is decelerating. Not great for workers uh, as well, where workers were getting some of the best raises they've seen or best increase in compensation they've seen. Uh, but what you see is, is that Jay Powell has been out there saying that the level of wage growth we have out there is not consistent with 2% inflation. I don't know what level of wage growth is consistent there, but that's that. So back to wage growth, we talked about the consistency there. Um, the savings rate has diminished. So we saw the big spike in savings rates. Uh, this was due to a lot of the stimulus that came there, came through. We hear about this concept of excess savings um, that was helping drive growth here. But now people are back to savings rates that are really consistent with kind of the more bullish scenarios, right? Look at when you had savings rates in these levels. That was kind of in the aughts when everyone was buying housing, uh, spending money, driving the economy. Uh, the savings rates uh, are below those kind of pre-pandemic levels. And so, um, you know, again, it's not that concerning, but it's not something that's a, that's a strong positive. Um, what's also not a strong positive is the explosion of the U.S. budget deficit. And so uh, this is something that's been on people's minds as of late. When you think about uh, what is, what's happened here, look at that we had the response mechanism during the pandemic. Obviously, it was a, a big crisis. It looked like we're starting to recover. Now, all of a sudden, look at what we're doing. We're expanding the deficit at 7% of GDP right now. 7% of GDP to grow. And again, these are nominal dollars. Um, you know, We're talking about a real growth rate that's estimated to be 2.1% slap inflation on that, maybe it's 5%, 5.5%, it says that we've essentially borrowed more than we've grown this year. So again, it's a it's a very kind of challenging environment. And just think about what happens if we tip over into a recession. It's going to be quite strong. So um, there, there's a big problem uh, with Washington. We all know it's continuing, but at some point, we're going to have to pay the piper one way or the other. Um, Lastly, uh, the Fed was launching or was running one of the biggest hedge funds in the world uh, where they were essentially they bought assets, uh, they financed at a very low rate. All of a sudden, they've had to change that dynamic. And so there is something that changed the methodology. Methodology did change in 2022. And so it's cumulative from that point on. But it's pretty amazing to show how much money that the Fed has lost. Right. This this is essentially what they have to go back and they're you know, they're they're paying. Uh, the overnight rates, but their asset pool yields like 2%, 2.5%. So they have this negative ARB that continues to erode money. So um, it, again, it was this nice kind of, uh, I'll call it the, the the carry trade that they had for so long. And now because of their rate policy, and again, you can see it's consistent with when they started hiking rates, it's, it's really driven that down. So let's talk about the markets real quick before we jump into the funds. So uh, what's here is, is four different asset class type of vol uh, volatility measures. Uh, the red, green, and black are on the one axis. That's the VIX, the FX vol, as well as high yield credit spreads. And then there's the blue line. The blue line is the move index. And what's important about the move index is that it's bond volatility. So it's the VIX equivalent of the bond market or the rates market. And so notice how elevated volatility has been in rates. Right. You can see that uh, pre pre pandemic, uh, we had a volatility level that was probably starting between 40 to 60 percent of today's levels. This is what's happened to the bond market. This is what happens when you get whipsaw behavior back and forth uh, and it leads to a lack of confidence in markets. If this type of volatility was going on in the equity markets, people would be panicked. 
Um, you look at the the calendar year performance. We we've, we've updated this. This is going back all, all the history of the of the Bloomberg Ag. And what you see here is that 2023 now is a, on pace to one be the fourth negative year in a row in the bond market. Secondly, uh, we're on a bad trajectory once again after starting off so strong uh, in the first month of the year. And more importantly, is that you know we're getting to these levels where essentially now yield levels should be enough to help insulate with some of the uh, price moves we're seeing out there. So uh, again, another tough year for a traditional U.S. aggregate that has a lot of interest rate sensitivity. Um, looking at the third quarter, just kind of reviewing it, taking major asset class into account, you can see there's a lot of negative numbers. Uh, the negative numbers, when I look at treasuries, agency MBS, CMO, agency CMBS, um, IG corporates, um, as well as EMFI sovereigns, um, those are essentially longer duration asset class. So fixed rate, they have duration. Duration was your enemy in the third quarter. Look at what did well. Floating rate assets, things like risky credit, uh, CLO triple Bs, uh, which we do own a, a fair amount of in some of the funds that I'm going to cover today. Uh, things that are down in the capital structure in the RMBS markets. And notice here that the non-agency CMBS market, uh, those tend to be a little bit longer duration assets as well. So they didn't benefit that some of the other credit sectors did. So um, it's a tale of two worlds. Uh, this world has it's it's very similar to what we saw uh, back uh, a year ago uh, with the rising in rates, the repricing. But now you this is the, the part of the cycle where because of this narrative about the U.S. exceptionalism, the risky parts of the credit market have really rallied. And so um, we don't think it's time to chase those assets. In fact, if anything, some of these uh, you should probably be a little skeptical of of, of those trends continuing. I uh, just had to update the Treasury drawdown chart uh, because we are at new highs in yields. When you start at very low yields, um, this means you have a meaningful drawdown. Who would have thought back buying a, a, a 30-year Treasury with a 1% coupon, we would make you down 53% on a cumulative basis uh, in, uh, over the next, uh, let's call it, uh, two and a half years, or it's really been three and a half years at this point. But again, this is what happens when you start at very low yields. Uh, I also point this out is that you know, if we do have a slowdown, we do, I think rates are too high. You get some reversal. You can really make some money in this idea. I don't think we're going to retest the lows that we saw in 2020. Uh, therefore, you're not going to essentially double uh, your your performance here. But this allows you uh, to kind of uh, have an asset that if there is some sort of rate rally, really participate. Uh, talking about credit, I said uh, it's been a risky credit rally. So we ranked uh, the credit sectors, and this gives a little more granularity. Um, and you can see here that it's the risky credit, CLO double Bs, uh, triple C bank loans, triple B CLO, single, e, single B loans. Notice it is the riskier parts of the market that have been doing well. Uh, high yield triple C, the loan market's done quite well this year, almost up 10%. And notice on the right-hand side. What you have is you have the things that have duration and also commercial real estate. And so uh, the triple B Tron to the CMBS is one of the riskier parts of the market. Yes, there's lower rated tranches, but it's the one that, that has uh, some default risk today as well. Uh, and so it continues to reprice. Looking at rates, uh, we took the rates view back to 07 just to show that where we are in the overall cycle right now, it is pretty amazing how, how much yields have repriced everywhere. Um, and if you look at this, uh, some people are talking about there being, you know, more of an inflation premium higher for longer, but that's not what the break-even market has told us. Yeah, 30-year break-evens have ticked up, maybe about 10, 15 basis point, but this last move in yields has been what we call a real rate rally and what, what I, or a real rate sell-off. And so what you what I'm looking at here, this is why you've seen some weakness again. In, in the equity markets, because when you think about um, the equity market, the PE multiple, it's the inverse of the EP, which is earnings yield, which is comparable to a real yield. And so when real yields go up, uh, it really puts pressure on markets. And notice they were going sideways this most of this year. That pressure hit meaningful last year and you're starting to see a new push upward. So the real yield can be two things. One, it can be growth. That's how most of us think about it. But potentially it is a term premium. Maybe there is some default premium priced into the market because of these structural deficits. And so time will tell with this, but this is not a higher 
inflationary regime, or at least that's not how the bond market seems to be responding over the last two months. It seems to be that there's this new premium in here on real yields. By the way, having real yields at this level is something that we really haven't seen well, since the late 90s. And so, yes, there's, there's brief periods in the 06, 07 environment, but in general to have at these levels, it's pretty strong. You can slap inflation on top of this, and that would be your nominal return going forward. Now, the downside to buying tips is that if you have deflation and you get a negative inflation rate, that actually detracts from the, from the overall yield as well. But right now, looking at this, this shows me that there is significant value, at least value we haven't seen in the rates market in a long time. This last push up in rates um, has driven the dollar index up, uh, where it looked like the dollar is really breaking down after getting to almost 115. Uh, earlier this year, it, it kissed a little bit below 100. I think it was a 99 handle um, uh, earlier in the year. And look at how it's rebounded meaningfully. It's because the U.S. rate move has been higher. This idea that the market is extracting some of these hikes out of the market. I just don't think the Fed really has the wherewithal, especially with all the conflicts going on, of actually hiking in the market today. Uh, copper gold uh, copper gold, and the 10-year have been very disconnected. Uh, they tend to converge at some point in time. Uh, right now, copper gold is saying that yields should be meaningfully lower, uh, and yields are saying that copper gold should be meaningfully higher. So at this stage, there really isn't too much uh, to note from this chart except extreme divergence. Usually when you get the extreme divergence, they meet. Look at early 2021 with copper gold spiking. You got them to me. Now we're kind of getting this reversal here that we haven't seen in yield. So uh, time will tell on this. It's been a very reliable indicator on the directionality. And uh, at least the yield market hasn't been listening to copper gold as of late. Uh, we all know about the yield curve in recessions. Remember, it's not the inversion that you, you get worried about a recession. It's actually when you uninvert or the curve steepens. And we've seen some steepener. This is the 10 year to three month. The tens twos is even tighter. Tens twos got to like 108, 109. Uh, we've been hovering in the low 30s at this point. So we have a bear steepener going on in the marketplace over the last two months. Um, and it's been something that um, even though it's a bear steepener versus the bull steepener, uh, you definitely should be on watch for what that means over the near term. And again, yields are higher. Ag is the highest level we've seen uh, in terms of its overall yield uh, since really uh, pre-GFC. And so, again, there's value in this side of the equation, uh, looking at bonds to do stuff for your other portfolio. Uh, if you want to get more creative than looking at just at the ag, um, these are uh, these are uh, bar charts. The bars show you what the min and the max and yields have been over the last 10 years. So 10 years ending last Friday. Uh, the average, you can see there, the average has been a lot lower uh, than where we are today. Today is the current snapshot, or at least as of Friday. And you can see here that things are in the upper end of the ranges. Uh, things like treasuries, agency mortgages, IG corporates, triple B CMBS are at really 10-year uh, uh, highs today. And so there is some value in owning some of these assets. A little more concerned about the CLO triple B. I do have some concern about the triple B CMBS market, um, but there are places to take some of that risk. Um, low quality bonds, you know, everybody focused on high yield or just loans in aggregate, but look at where the yields are. Even after the performance I showed you, triple C high yield still yields 15. Why is it yield 15? You're probably not going to get 15, right? You're going to have some defaults along the way. These are to no losses. Look at triple C bank loans because they're floating in nature. They've, uh, again, there's probably a little bit more default risk in some of these names, 16.5%. Again, don't think you get 16%. Look at corporate triple C's and EMFI on the far right-hand side, 16. But you don't have to go there. There's eights, there's nines, there's tens in higher quality assets on this. So what I wanted to really show here was that there are ways of taking credit bets out there that maybe aren't run in the mill. Maybe they're not readily accessible through an ETF, but if you're going to take risk out there in the markets, there is a calculated way of doing so. And another way of thinking about that is the price of the assets. And uh, we've illustrated this earlier in the year, but just look how low some of these bond prices are. And I point this out because if you buy a bond, your, your best case scenario is that you get par back at maturity. Maybe it's callable, you get 101 or something like that. But in general, par at maturity is what you're looking for. And so if you can buy an asset at 80 cents on the dollar, like EMFI Sovereigns, and they don't default on you, there's 20 points of upside there. One, 
Secondly, if spreads tighten in, there's the ability to trade some of this as well. So prices can indeed go up. Uh, you insulate yourself against some losses out there, but more importantly, you give yourself the ability to trade around if need be. So let's talk about what this means for portfolios today. Hopefully you found the, the, you know, the idea that there is some yield out there pretty compelling today. Now there's different ways to execute on it. For those that have been concerned about the rate environment, that the Fed's going to be higher for longer, um, one thing we've offered here at Double Line for a long time is our low duration fund. And so, again, the low duration fund has done quite well, as Sam pointed out at the top of the show, because it has less interest rate sensitivity uh, than, than a traditional bond fund. And notice if you look at the yield to maturity over there, how we drive it, there's yield coming from all kinds of points of the portfolio. Uh, we're getting it at a 6.7% yield to maturity today. That yield to maturity, it consists of uh, nine different sectors of the overall bond market uh, over there. Notice there, it's a credit heavy portfolio. 70% sits in credit. So there's not a lot of risk offset in this portfolio because it's high quality credit. Notice 61% of this portfolio is triple A rated. Okay. So part of that is the government uh, sleeve. That's the 23%. But the CLO, 16% is all in the triple A part of the market. Some of our CMBS is triple A rated. We have some non agency RMBS, triple A rated. So there are pockets of the, of the credit markets that offer value today. Look at 6.7% yield. I don't have to take duration risk. And notice my below investment grade bucket, right? I got 4% in double Bs. Most of those are bank loans, right? Some of them are crossover names, but most of those sit in that area. Yeah, there's a little bit uh, in the ABS market as well. I got some unrated securities. That's because the, they don't get paid. We don't pay for ratings anymore in the securitized market after what the ratings agencies did. But you can see here that this is a high quality portfolio. It clips coupon, it grinds along, and you have less interest rate sensitivity. So we've heard a lot about the T-bill trade out there. Why do I do anything? Well, I would, as a bond investor, I like 5.5 on my bills. It's a little lower today. It's probably 540 right now, uh, given some of the rate move we've seen. But it's 540. I can pick up 130 by sitting out here and looking at something like this type of portfolio. So again, the volatility has been quite low. Notice positions. Uh, I, I do get some pushback on the CMBS position at 14%. This is extremely high quality. This is short duration assets. A lot of this paper is indeed AAA rated, and we believe it to be AAA rated. So again, with a high quality portfolio, um, you know, not not a lot of uh, mark to market. Or there is some mark to market risk, not a lot of default risk in there. Notice the duration at 1.2 year. Now, if you want to keep a similar type of duration, it's a little bit longer. We have a 1.7 year duration here, but you want to take some risk, and you think that the you think the credit markets are still pretty ripe for opportunity. Notice you can step your yield up, so you can get a 9.3 percent yield to maturity. Maybe there's a little bit of default in here. The CLO bucket here at 20 percent is not triple A. Uh, a lot of this sits in the triple B bucket. We do have a smattering across the capital structure, but primary is in that triple B side of the equation. Uh, our CMBS is going to be a little riskier. All of these are going to be a little bit riskier today. Uh, heavy, all heavy allocation to bank loans, and you saw in the low duration, this is more run-of-the-mill bank loan, like a, a single B type. We have high-yield bonds. We have EMD in here as well. As notice, uh, if you follow along in the flexible income fund, this is the largest position we've had in government-backed assets really since the inception of the strategy. And that's because we want a little bit of offset in there. Um, the government is not a long-duration asset. We're sitting between the two- and three-year parts of the curve. We're taking advantage of some of the cheapness of the agency MBS market as well. But in general, uh, again, this is a credit-sensitive portfolio. If credit has hiccups, this portfolio will have some challenges on spread widening. Uh, but I thought it was interesting to show folks that there are ways, if you want to take a calculated bet on credit today, that we think is much more attractive than just narrowly focused on high yields or just focusing on bank loans or just going to local uh, currency emerging market debt. Trying to have more diverse exposures that can help insulate you against experiences when there's credit events. So again, uh, this one should not be thought of as a high, high quality portfolio. Notice in there, you know, you've got uh, over a third of the portfolio that is uh, below investment grade today. And a lot of the um, credit risk sits in that triple B area as well. So definitely not the same as the low duration strategy. But again, tapping into what our credit sectors are doing here at Double Line. And we think, you know, again, 
for those looking for an opportunity in the near term, uh, there is some sort of very powerful behavior in the flex fund today. Uh, traditional fixed income, which is our core fixed income strategy. This is the thing we compare against the Barclays U.S. aggregate. Notice here the yield to maturity. So all of a sudden now we have a 6.7% yield to maturity. Very similar to what I said about low duration, right? So I can get the same kind of yield profile, but this one indeed has duration. So we run this with uh, you know a tracking error relative to the index. So uh, we're trying to balance out to intermediate term fund. So you shouldn't have a duration of one or two years. Uh, we have the uh, one of the longer durations we've had in the history of the fund. Um, but what we've been doing is lengthening the duration. We did this late last year, part of early this year. We kind of stopped that game plan, um, you know, as we went into the the later spring and, and summer months, as we thought the economy was looking much better, that we shouldn't be adding more duration. Let's keep the credit we have. So about 55% credit today. Um, you can see, again, very diversified, uh, significantly less um, in high yield and loans than you saw in the flexible strategy, more spread around. Uh, some in the higher quality categories like investment grade corporates, uh, some of the higher quality CMBS as well. And also our below investment grade bucket is more like 15% in this strategy versus something more uh, akin to 30 in the flexible strategy. This one zigs and zags more with the ag. Uh, our duration on our government sleep is longer than the market. Uh, we're doing that to balance out our weighted average portfolio duration. And a lot of our credit sits on the shorter end of the curve, call it within three years and in uh, for a lot, of the, um, a lot of the exposures we own today. And so for that reason, we wanna have a balanced structure in there the reason for owning that duration is so we stay comfortable with the amount of credit that we own today. So, again, uh, yield pickup to the ag, zigs and zags more with that market, has duration. If bad things happen, we believe that the duration side of the portfolio, that 43%, can be helpful and accretive to investors. And, again, it, it depending on where we are in that cycle, when that happens, gives us the ability to sell some of that and buy more credit. Uh, if spreads tighten in, maybe we sell a little bit more credit, buy more rates. Uh, but right now, we're very comfortable with the way this portfolio is throwing off cash flow and its allocation across uh, the 12 different sectors of the bond market. And then lastly, uh, last but not least, of course, our ETF opportunity in the multi-asset space, uh, similar to the core strategy, but uh, this one's a little more opportunistic in nature. It's going to have a little bit more exposure to some of those credit sectors, or at least the higher octane credit sectors. You can see that also a little bit more credit risk kind of sits in that below investment grade bucket, it's very similar. I'd say, I'm sorry, it, it sits between the flex strategy and the and the core fixed income strategy. The duration similar to having that longer duration exposure. But notice here, we have a little bit of yield give up because of that. But notice what's going on there. Um, you still have a, a meaningful contribution to uh, contribution to yield from the various parts of the market, and so uh, we're very uh, ex uh, we're very excited for the way these portfolios are positioned today. I know it's been a rough couple of months um, as yields have repriced. Um, there's massive capitulation in the market, as I said at the beginning, uh, and it just feels to me that we're getting closer to the end point in yield rises as well as interest rate hikes from the Fed. Uh, I don't think that, that means that things reverse instantaneously, but giving me a market where I can earn, earn somewhere between six to nine percent in high quality and some in that nine percent, so a riskier type of fixed income portfolio makes a lot of sense in today's market, especially with valuation across some of the private markets and other things we've seen out there. So with that, that concludes my remarks for today. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, in the queue, and so I'll I'll tackle this today. Uh, someone saying, as a retiree, any suggestion for investing in bonds? Um, it's discipline. Just like anything else, um, know what you're trying to achieve. Um, you know, We have a bunch of solutions out here for you. As a retiree, I would not focus on the flexible income strategy. I would look at things like our low duration or even just our core or DBND offerings uh, simply because they're more vanilla type of offerings. And so I think a retiree, you need to focus on income. Income is available to you today. Uh, and there's the ability to try try to uh, try to monetize some of that as well. Uh, next is Sam Newsbaum. My great uncle was Sam Newsbaum from Deal, New Jersey. So his branch is from Frankfurt in the late '80s. So Mark Newsbaum, I want to give you a shout out to Sam Newsbaum. We'll have Sam get in touch with you. So we have your details. So good to hear about that. Let's keep the Newsbaum family uh, family going here. Um, next question here is. 
Does China's CPI include residential real estate in the index? The answer is, I don't know. We don't trust any data that comes out of there. So I, I think that it's very difficult to look at data. Remember, when Chinese data was not looking good, they just contained the series. So a tough area to look at. So again, uh, I'm not really sure what's in there. I don't trust a lot of it. Um, someone saying, how much emphasis do you place on geopolitical dynamics and separately U.S. political alternatives, um, Trump, Biden, and others? Uh, look, geopolitical is going to dominate right now. There's no doubt. Yes, we have dysfunction in Congress. Yeah, we just ousted the Speaker of the House by his own party. That That's kind of uh, somewhat impressive, I believe. Um, yes, it's going to get worse before it gets better. RFK is running as a third-party candidate now. I mean, it feels like peak uh, uh, peak polarization within our, geo, our, our own political system. But right now, what's going to dominate everything is the geopolitical landscape and what's going on in Israel and the Gaza Strip. It's unfortunate what's happened so far, and it's unfortunate the things that continue on right now. And so I think that's going to dominate uh, markets for the time being. And uh, don't worry, we'll have our, our, our chance in the sun with our dysfunction when it comes to the political season next year. So uh, I don't look forward to it. It's a headache that, that most of us don't need, but it is something that we all have to deal with. Uh, can you talk about the recent spike in oil prices? Has it been demand-driven or announced supply cuts? Uh, it's the latter. It's the supply cuts that have been driving most of it. Um, and then there's been this kind of resurgence in the U.S. demand story, although it is seasonal in nature as, again, the, uh, the, the travel season as you get later into the year. If you look at forward-looking ticket demand from airlines, you're not seeing it. So to me, it is a supply story. The question becomes, if is Iran supply out there? So Iran exports around 2 million barrels of oil, supposedly, to the marketplace today, um, plus or minus a few hundred thousand barrels. And so if there is some kind of sanctions there, finds out their involvement, or they get involved, uh, that could cause more problems. Oil prices going higher will not make the Fed hike. Um, it's not going to do that because oil prices going higher, it hits the end consumer. The end consumer sees that as inflation because that is where they judge inflation is the price at the pump. This is deflationary in the short term because your spending goes to oil and consumption of energy versus uh, other areas. Uh, the next person wrote me a missive, a lot of words in there that I, I will have to get back to you on, on that one. Um, munis and risk are city's doom loop. Uh, not sure what that means either. All right. Are the cash positions in the mattresses or T-bills or other? Uh, we do not store cash in mattresses here at Double Line. They're either in sweep accounts or in extremely short-term T-bills. Uh, and we just call them cash because uh, of their of their nature. So you'll see cash. Some of it is actual cash. It sits in stiff accounts, what we call money market funds for spending. And then sometimes that sits in like an accrual bucket as well. So uh, thanks for the uh, plumbing question. Um, and with that, that's all the questions I have for today. Uh, to the missive, we'll, we'll get back to you on that one. Uh, if the Muni's and Risk Cities Doom Loop wants to uh, send us an email, send it to fundinfo at doubleline.com. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, thanks for your support of Double Line. We're here to answer any questions. We wish you success as we get to the end of this year. Um, starting to feel like the bond market's offering some good opportunities. Uh, we thought that all throughout the year. But the good news is with uh, with bonds that they're high quality, they do pay you back at par when it's time for maturity. So they do serve as a ballast in the portfolio. So thanks again, everyone. It's into my webcast uh, for the year. I'll talk to you next year on the webcast. And don't forget to catch us on our, our various podcasts that we put out there. And more importantly, if you want to watch this stuff, go to the youtube.com backslash double line capital or youtube.com backslash double line funds. Thanks again and take care, everyone.